Hello and welcome to the electromagnetic induction unit of Phys 1204. We're going to start by looking at some simple cases where we can see how magnetic fields can be used to drive currents through conductors. We're going to start with an observation that moving a magnet into or out of a coil of wire can induce a current in the coil. So I've set up a coil here with an ammeter and if you look at the connections, you can see that this wire comes into the coil and goes around this way and eventually comes out here. And there is the positive connection to the ammeter. And so that tells you that if current is going counterclockwise around this coil, it's going to show up as, as a positive current. So here is a rare earth magnet and I've labeled the sides because you can't tell just by looking at them. And I'm taking the north pole and I am pushing it in and pulling it out and pushing it in and pulling it out. And if you watch the ammeter, you can see it flickers and you can also see that there are different signs. So now I'm gonna flip around to the south pole, push it in and out and in and out. And if you look at that, you will have seen that the direction of the current changed depending on which pole I used and depending on whether I pushed it in or pulled it out. We've just seen not only that moving a magnet can induce a current in a coil, but that the direction of the current depends on which pole of the magnet is used, and it also depends on whether the pole is moving in or out of the coil. And we want to be able to explain all of these observations. And I'll just summarize that in this picture where I show the idea of moving a north pole of a magnet in towards a coil or out or the south pole in or out. And all these current directions I've drawn are correct, but it's going to take us until the next lecture until we can really justify them all. Also, it's important to note that current only flows in the coil when the magnet is moving. So it's clearly something to do with changing the magnetic field inside the coil, which suggests that we could also do this by using another coil and turning on the current in it so that it produces a magnetic field that it wasn't producing before. And again, you've changed the magnetic field inside this other coil down here and you can make a current flow in it, even though the battery you're using isn't connected to this coil. The currents induced in a coil by the moving magnet are a little difficult to understand, and we will understand it, but it's going to take us a while. We're going to start with a simpler case of a conducting rod moving through a magnetic field. So here's some conducting rod, some chunk of metal of length L, moving with some velocity through a B field, and I've put the B field into the page. And if you think about what's going to happen, one thing to recognize is that this conducting rod is full of charges and the electrons in it are free to move. Well, if you work through the right-hand rule, this V with this B on a negative charge, you get a magnetic force down, like so. As usual, though, we're going to make life easier on ourselves, and we're going to pretend that what's inside the conductor is actually positive charges, and so they have a magnetic force upwards on them, like so. Well, that's going to cause positive charge to collect at one end of the rod, leaving the other end of the rod negative. We've just had charge separation, and so as usual, charge separation will produce an E field inside the rod. Well, eventually, and eventually is in fact very quickly, there will be an equilibrium established where the downward force due to that E field on these charges exactly balances the upward magnetic force and the net force on these positive charges inside the conductor is zero. So we've got our conducting rod full of these positive charges. They're moving through this B field at some V that's created a force on them that separates them. So we have a positive charge up here, a negative charge down here, and an E field this way. And so the free body diagram for those charges is an upward magnetic force, a downward electric force, balancing so F net is zero. And so if we take our sum of forces in the Y direction, then we have FB, which 
v is perpendicular to b and so that cross product is just going to come out q v b right no sine theta to worry about minus q e equals zero. Oh look the q's are gone and we get that the e field just ends up being equal to v times b. Well now because we know that the length of the rod is some l we can say that the e is some voltage difference across the rod over L, right? Delta V over L, and that equals VB. And so that tells us we are going to see a voltage between the two ends of the rod of VBL. This situation with the moving rod in the magnetic field is analogous to a battery in a very useful way. Think about what's happening here. There's an E field set up, an electric charge is being transported against that E field. And so the magnetic forces are acting to move charge uphill in the voltage. Well, that's exactly what we've seen happen in a battery where chemical reactions are being used to transport charge against an E field, or in other words, from low V to high V. So a battery and a moving rod can both move charges against an E field, or uphill in the voltage. This is what's meant by an EMF. We've been using this term EMF for a battery without maybe really knowing what it means. An EMF is any situation where you have forces or some other process that are moving charges up in potential, or in other words, against an E field. So as a result, we call this delta V across the rod a motional EMF, because it is an EMF that results from the motion through a magnetic field. And we just had the rod moving through the magnetic field. There was no current, everything was in equilibrium. But if you now let it slide along wires, you've got a closed path and current can flow around it. And note that it's important that these wires are not moving because if this piece of wire here was moving through the B field, there would be an EMF in it as well and that would exactly cancel this one and you would get no current. But now that you have this connected like this, you're going to have a current that is just the motional EMF over the total resistance of the path, right? The resistance of the rod plus these wires. Now, as soon as you have a current in a magnetic field, you know that there's a magnetic force. And if you go through the right-hand rule, upward current field into the page, you get a magnetic force back like so. And so that's going to slow the rod down. If that's the only force, then the rod will slow down. Let's say we want to keep our motional EMF constant. Then we're going to have to pull with an equal magnitude force in the opposite direction. And we can now work out what those will be. Our F pull magnitude is the same as the magnitude of the magnetic force and we know a magnetic force on a wire is just I B L and we know what I is it's V B L over R so V B L over R all times B L all right well one more thing Let's think about power, because we should have a situation here if we're keeping this rod moving at constant speed and there's a constant current here, all of the powers should cancel, right? So our F pull results in a power, so I'll say power due to the pull. And as usual, you can calculate that just by the force times the speed. And so if you just look at what that force is, we get V squared, B squared, L squared over R. Now think about the power 
dissipated by the resistance here. That's going to be I squared R, as it always is. And we know I, it's VBL over R. So you get V squared B squared L squared over R squared all times R. Oh, look. So our input power and our dissipated power are equal, as we knew they had to be. We should have been surprised if we didn't get these equal. Let's see what we can do with our newfound power source. So let's say that we've got our rod and our B field is 0.1 Tesla, which is fairly large, but achievable. And our rod is 10 centimeters long, and we want to light a flashlight bulb. Okay, so here's the circuit symbol for a bulb. And a fairly standard flashlight bulb requires three volts and puts out 1.5 watts which you can think of as the power due to the resistive load over here. And so you can work through that power is delta V squared over R and find that the resistance of this is 6 ohms. And let's figure out how fast you need to pull the rod to light the bulb at full brightness. Well, that's easy. We just need to provide our 1.5 volts. So in other words, VBL, there's our uh, emotional EMF, has to equal our delta V of the bulb, our 3 volts. And so V is just 3 volts over B, which is 0.1 Tesla, L, which is 0.1 meters. Wow! We have to pull this rod at 300 meters per second to light that flashlight bulb. That's kind of disappointing, isn't it? Right? You would, you would hope that maybe you could light the flashlight bulb a lot more easily than that. Well, as we're going to see as we go on, there are far more efficient ways than this setup to use magnetic, for, uh, magnetic fields to produce EMFs. I'm going to finish off this lecture just by pointing out an interesting application of motional EMF. Imagine you have some conductor like so, and it's moving that way, and you have a magnet just above it. So I've drawn a north pole, and so the B field would be pointing down through this conductor. Then that is going to induce a current going this way in the conductor. And those currents are going to circulate around like so. And we've already seen then that this situation results in a magnetic force back this way. And so that is a braking force that will tend to slow this conductor down. And this is called eddy current braking. And it's seen all over the place. For example, here is from a roller coaster, and these are this is the roller coaster track, and these are just great big magnets, and this is the braking system for the roller coaster. The roller coaster car would have some metal plates on the bottom that run in between those magnets, and that's what slows the cars down at the end of the ride.